The Heine Borel theorem is a standard result in upper mathematics. Okay, I already need to stop and explain. When I say upper mathematics, I mean math that needs introductory formal logic and naive set theory to understand. It is a type of math taught to mathematics majors in colleges called a proofs class. For non-math people, a proofs class is the secret Rosetta Stone to understanding the arcane symbols and hieroglyphs of math. To fully understand this video, I will assume that you've had this secretive proofs class. When I say standard result, I mean a theorem that is proven in the majority of classes that teach this type of math. In this case, real analysis. The heine borel theorem is famous, as most name theorems in math are. Here is the statement of the theorem. A subset of RP is compact if and only if it's closed and bounded. The point of this video is to prove one direction of this statement and explain fully why the proof works and where each sentence of the proof comes from, a proof analysis. I will try to explain the concepts and how they interrelate. The direction I will prove is necessity, or if a subset of RP is compact, then it is closed and bounded. This is the easier of the two directions. Why it is easier, hopefully I'll make clear later. For now, let's just understand what compactness is. A set K is said to be compact if, whenever it is contained in the union of a collection of sets, G is equal to some G sub A of open sets, then it is also contained in the union of some finite number of the sets in G. Why this seemingly random definition? Compactness gives a way in math to do something difficult, to move from the infinite to the finite. It allows me to stop talking about an infinite number of things and then get to talk about a finite number of things. This is useful because a finite amount is usually much easier to talk about than an infinite amount of things, because infinity is confusing. The way to talk about the definition is to call G an open cover. So compactness gives the existence of a finite open cover, if there is any open cover. It's a strong condition, it's very powerful. The problem is that the definition is hard to work with. In order to prove something is compact, I have to take an arbitrary open cover and show that there's a finite subcover which is hard to do because infinity is confusing. So if I have a set B, if B has an open cover, I can write B as a subset of this union, the union of all the sets G sub A, each of which are open for each given index A. If B is compact, then I can say B is a subset of G1, union, so on, union, G sub N, for a finite number of sets. In this case, there would be exactly N sets. The thing to keep in mind about compactness is the motion from the infinite to the finite. What is RP? It's p-dimensional real space. That sounds crazy, but it's just the next step from 1D to 2D to 3D, then to 4D or PD. The theorem is true for R3 or normal 3D space, so if RP causes confusion, you can just think of it as R3 instead of RP or R2. The difference is not important for the proof. The other two concepts in the theorem are closed and bounded. For closed, there are many ways to think of it, but we're going to use the definition that closed sets are complements of open sets. An open set in RP is a set that can be written as the union of open balls. So if B is an open set, we can write B is a union of B sub A, where each B sub A is an open ball, or all points less than a certain distance away from some center point. It is the interior of a sphere in 3D, much like planet Earth below the crust. Open sets have many equivalent definitions. A thing to keep in mind is that to prove a set is open, we need to pick an arbitrary point in the set, x is an element of b, and show there is an open ball with center x that doesn't go outside b. The open ball must be entirely contained inside b. If that's true, then b is open. For boundedness, we will use the definition that a set b is bounded if it's contained in some open ball centered at zero. We can think of all human activity as bounded by our solar system. The distance from the sun to the edge of our solar system would be the upper bound. Now we can move on to the proof. A good idea with proving things is knowing what we can assume and what we're trying to prove. We want to prove the statement, if a subset of RP is compact, then it is closed and bounded. So we can assume we have some subset of RP that is compact, call it K, and we want to show that it's both closed and bounded. Proof. First we show that if k is compact in RP, then k is closed. We are now in the proof. 
This first statement is reiterating the goal and showing that first we will focus on just proving that compactness implies closeness. We will worry about boundedness later. Proof. Let x belong to the complement of k, and for each natural number m, let g sub m be defined by the set g sub m is equal to the set of all y in Rp such that the distance between y and x is greater than 1 over m. What we have done is picked a point from the complement of k, so x is not an element of k, and we have defined a collection of sets g sub m, which there are an infinite amount of, one for each of the natural numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. The definition of the g sub m's is important, and something we will come back to throughout this part of the proof. Proof. It is readily seen that each set g sub m, m in the natural numbers, is open in Rp. A way to quickly see this, though, and the reason he says it is readily seen, is because each one of the gm's is the complement of a closed ball, or an open ball that includes the crust. If a set is the complement of a closed ball, then it's open since complements of open sets are closed. Remember, complements of open sets are closed, and complements of closed sets are open. Proof. Also, the union of all the sets g sub m, m in the natural numbers, consists of all points of Rp except x. What this says is that if we look at what happens as m gets bigger and bigger, in the definition for g sub m, the distance between y and x is greater than something that is getting smaller and smaller so y and x can get closer and closer together. But they can't be the same, otherwise the distance between y and x would be zero, and the definition says that the distance between y and x must always be positive. So if we take all possible points and all possible gms, the only thing not in the union is the point x, the very point that would make the distance between y and x zero. Proof. Since x is not in k, each point of k belongs to some set g sub m. Since the union of all the g sub m's as m gets bigger and bigger is every point of Rp except x, then since x is not in k, all of k is in the union of the g sub m's. Proof. In view of the compactness of k, it follows that there exists a natural number m such that k is contained in the union of the sets g1, g2, and so on, gm. We are now using what we assumed, that k is compact. In general, when proving things, it is a must to use the things that you assume. That is what the statement is doing. We are using the compactness of k. Since the union of the gm's is an open covering and k is compact, we can say that there are a finite number of the gm's that k is covered by. We say there are m of these sets. So k is in the finite covering g1 union and so on union gm. This is the important step in why we define the gm's like we did in the first place. It was to get to this step, and use the fact that k is compact. That is the general strategy for proving things, is to define things with an idea of using them in a specific way later. Proof. Since the sets g sub m increase with m, then k is contained in gm. By increasing sets, we mean g1 is a subset of g2, is a subset of so on, is a subset of gm. Since k is in the union of the sets g1 and so on gm, by definition of union, we can just say that k is a subset of gm. Proof. Hence, the neighborhood, the set of all z and rp, such that the distance between z and x is less than 1 over m, does not intersect k, showing that the complement of k is open. Since k is a subset of gm, then every point y and k has the property that the distance between y and x is greater than 1 over m. Remember that x is the point we chose way at the beginning, and x is in the complement of k. Since every point y in k has the property that the distance between y and x is greater than 1 over m, then every point z, where the distance between z and x is less than 1 over m, is not in k. So the set of all such points, the neighborhood of x, has no common points with k, so they do not intersect. And we've done it we have found an open neighborhood of the point x that is entirely contained in the complement of k. This is one way to prove that a set is open, so the complement of k is open. Proof. Therefore, k is closed in Rp. Since the complement of k is open, by definition, k must be closed. This completes the proof that if k is compact, then k is closed. Some thoughts on the proof so far. The strategy we used to prove that k is closed is to prove that the complement of k is open. Keeping that strategy in mind, we wanted to use the fact that k is compact somehow. 
we wanted a specific open cover that when we made the change from infinite to finite, used the compactness assumption, we could show that an arbitrary point in the complement of K had an open ball around it wholly contained in K complement. That is why the G sub M sets were defined in that way. Their definition makes the back half of the proof easier. If constructing the proof without the answer, that is a common trick to use, working backwards. Start with what you want to prove and try to mold it into something you can use. The meat of the proof is in the definition of the G sub M's. Proof. Next we show that if K is compact in RP, then K is bounded. That is, K is contained in some set, the set of all X and RP such that the norm of X is less than R for sufficiently large R. Now we are trying to prove that K is bounded, using the idea that it is contained in some open ball, center zero, which is what that set we defined is. It's why he chose R for radius. Proof. In fact, for each natural number M, let H sub M be the open set defined by H sub M is equal to the set of all X in RP, such that the norm of X is less than M. We have now defined another collection of sets. The reason he says in fact is because the idea for the definition comes directly from the definition of boundedness. We just use natural numbers for the radius. Proof. The entire space RP and hence K is contained in the union of the increasing sets H sub M. M is a natural number. All of RP is in the countable union of the H sub M's, since given any point Z in RP, eventually there will be an M where the norm of Z is less than M since the m's grow to infinity. Since all of rp is in the union of the h sub m's, k must be in the union. Also, the sets are increasing like before. h1 is a subset of h2, is a subset, and so on. Proof. Since k is compact, there exists a natural number m such that k is a subset of hm. Just like before, we are using the compactness of k on the open cover, the union of the hm's. This is the important step and is similar to what we did before. Since the sets are increasing like before, K is a subset of the largest set, HM. Proof. This proves that K is bounded. That K is a subset of HM is our definition of bounded. Writing RP as the union of the open balls center zero is a standard trick, something that is useful to do in certain situations. This kind of rewriting to fit whatever you are working with is a common occurrence in math. We have finished what we set out to do, prove that a compact subset of RP is closed and bounded. We saw that compactness of a set implies that the complement of that set is open. Also, we saw that the definition of boundedness can be extended to an open cover of all of RP, so that very quickly any compact subset of RP must be bounded. The fact that compact sets are closed and bounded is true in metric spaces with the standard topology. So what we saw is true even if we lose some of the very nice properties that RP has. For more, check out the famous Principles of Mathematical Analysis by Rudin. For completeness, I'm using R.G. Bartle's Elements of Real Analysis, second edition. This is not my proof. I love this book, and it was introduced to me by one of my undergraduate professors. I am dedicating this video to him. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to ask me below. I would recommend stopping the video at each part of the proof and trying to come up with explanations for yourself. Uh, that's the best way to learn math is there's no easy roads. You got to do it yourself. See you next time.